the new George Clooney movie is featured in film 2007 in 45 minutes. First on BBC One, every picture tells a story. Julie is the queen of soap. I've never come across such an egomania for someone who's just an actress in a show. It's a great British disease, isn't it? We build them up, we build them up, we build them up and then knock them down. She thought, I'll quit while I'm on top and go and do something else. Of course, it didn't quite work out like that. I can tell you that there were several cast members who were deliberately... Really? ...spreading malicious gossip about you. Really? Yeah. Would that shock you? Yes. Would you feel betrayed by that? Yes. Have you never suspected that? Never. Ever. Julie Goodyear may not be a one-man woman, but she's definitely a one-role woman. And what a role. For 25 years, she triumphantly ruled over the TV landscape, playing Coronation Street's larger-than-life landlady, Bet Lynch. But away from a sanctuary of the street, her increasingly complicated private life disintegrated, and the tabloids lapped it up, especially when she made a high-profile return to Corrie after a seven-year break and lasted just 17 days. So how did Britain's first soap superstar come to lose the only job that ever really mattered to her? Who killed off Bet Lynch? As a Fleet Street editor, I liked nothing better than front-page scandals involving our small-screen stars who got just a little carried away with their newfound celebrity. This is no new phenomenon. Back in the 80s, there was one woman who single-handedly kept us all in headlines. I'm sorry I'm late, Mrs Walker. Good heavens! I think every woman loved Bet and every bloke fancied her. Every man in the building, from the producer down to the doorman, had an immediate desire to rip the knickers completely off the woman. Julie Goodyear, in her peak, in her prime, it was good time for her. People wanted to know about it because no one could, could really understand her. As if her private life wasn't bad enough, her diva-like antics on set were legendary. And there is an argument that if someone brings in ratings and makes people watch that show, that they can get away with a certain amount of diva-like behaviour. But I think she became too big for her boots. You know what you are, don't you? Well, you're wicked. And like so many other soap stars, at the height of her career, she quit. But life away from the street was a lot quieter than she imagined. I think it is impossible for viewers to ever see Julie as just Julie. They will always see her as Julie Goodyear and Bet. So when Corrie asked her to come back to prop up the flagging show, she returned amid great fanfare. But what should have been the perfect homecoming nearly cost her her sanity. I want to know if she really did jump, or if she was in fact pushed by the people she'd worked with for 25 years. So Julie, where did it all start for you? I was born in Haywood, uh, North Manchester, uh, an only child, uh, very, very working class and very proud of it. So you were quite a, a war baby then, in many yes. ways? Yes, yeah, so don't hurt me, I'm a war baby. <laughs> and as you grew up, how would you describe your childhood? Um, well, I suppose, looking back, it would be de described as very poor, but because I thought, uh, in my own little world, that everybody lived like that. It never seemed very poor. I was going to say earlier about your early life, your father came back from the war, stayed with your mother for a while, but then, then he left, didn't he? Yes, yes, what, he did. What was your memory of that? Was it a big blow to you at the time? Not really, because my grandma really was the love of my life. I felt very safe with her. Julie's relationship with her biological father ended when she was just six, but tragedy followed Julie into her teenage years. Her grandmother died in a freak accident, drowning in a local canal. And shortly after, her mother began a lifelong battle with chronic anorexia. Was all this making you tougher or more fragile, do you think? Both. There had to be um, an inbuilt resilience. Uh, it, but it, it didn't mean that you, didn't, you weren't bleeding inside. So that you had not just the death of 
the grandmother you love, but your mother then suffering really this mm. appalling illness all her life as a direct result, mm -hmm. and your father's gone. I mean, you've you know you've had a very tough start to your life. I know, really. I know. but first a song. <laughs> <laughs> With the arrival of the swinging 60s, Julie began modelling, becoming a pin-up girl in the factory where she worked as a secretary. And even at that early stage, revealing a liking for leopard print. Her home life has settled down too. Her mother had remarried and ran a pub with her husband, Bill Goodyear. And just at the point when it seemed like normality was returning to Julie's life, calamity struck again. The very first time you ever had sex, you got pregnant. That's right, yes. I mean, <laughs> How lucky can you get, Pierce? How unlucky can one woman be? <laughs> Go on there. Yeah. How That's did you right. feel when you knew you were pregnant? I had no idea. I didn't even know I was pregnant. It was my mother who told me. So when you discovered you were pregnant, how did you feel about that? I was, I was just, uh, again, in shock. I couldn't believe it. Because at the time, to be an unmarried pregnant Ooh. woman... Don't even go there. Quite a stigma. Oh, absolutely. Terrible. Quite shameful to family. That, and... In the back streets, you had really brought complete shame. Judy decided that her best option was a shotgun wedding. So in 1959, now 17 and two months pregnant, she married Ray Sutcliffe. Did you feel scared by... by... Oh, absolutely. Terrified. Because, you know, what sort of chance did it stand, really? in that, that kind of situation. But yeah, that decision was made. Otherwise, that baby would not have the father's name on the certificate and therefore would be considered to be a bastard. Gary was born in April 1960, but that very same year, Granada was giving birth to something very, very different. A new phenomenon which was to take the UK and then the world by storm. Britain's first soap opera, Coronation Street. All of a sudden, we had these real people uh, that everyone could um, connect with and identify with. The working classes are not usually talked about uh, in drama, both on the stage and in, you know, and in film, but this was the turning point. Oh, Coronation Street's all right. Mind, there's some you'll have to watch. It was your kitchen sink drama, strong matriarchal women, extreme operatic emotions. They always had affairs, they always had murders, even in the early days, but it always had heart and it always had humour. I mean, they say today, you know, good old days, you know, you could leave your door open, you could leave your door open because you had bugger all a pinch. And that's why you could leave your bloody door open, but everybody was skint. Everybody had nothing. And that was just like that in Coronation Street. Coronation Street wasn't an instant critical success, and some Granada insiders even doubted it would survive its initial 13-part run. But just like Julie, viewers loved it and connected instantly with the ordinary characters to make it the longest-running and consistently highest-rated programme on British television. So did you want to be, do you think, a successful actress when you were young or to be famous, to be a celebrity? Probably, probably a bit of both. But it wasn't, it actually wasn't until I saw the very first episode of Coronation Street that I knew exactly what I wanted. That's where I'm going and I'm having it. So six years after you watch the first mm. episode of Coronation Street and think, I'm having that. Yeah. You are having that. You're in the show. How did that happen? Well, you know, there were lots of other jobs before that. There was modelling work, only the hands and feet. They didn't want any, anything else. But <laughs> fortunately, because I've only got size four feet and tiny, tiny hands, oh boy, was I in demand. <laughs> I tell you. I mean, I don't take this the wrong way, but I never really idolised you in my youth for your feet and hands. No. Julie. Just when I was young, other parts of your anatomy were rather really? striking, I think, is a yes. polite way of putting yeah. it. I can't even... The eyes, obviously. <laughs> obviously. But her eyes, hands and everything else did get Julie a break on Coronation Street. And in 1966, she got her first role playing factory worker Bet Lynch. Hey, they do pies, kid. How much are your pies, love? Steak and kidney, meat and potato, cheese and onion. Meat and tater. Ten pence each. You did the part for six weeks. Yeah. And was it everything you'd imagined it would be, or was it Oh, different? yes, I loved it. I absolutely adored it. I felt that I felt I'd come home. This, this was where I should be, yeah. But after six weeks, mm. you were 
shown the door. Why? Because that was the extent of the storyline. That was it. It was finished. It was just a short storyline. So I, I was absolutely devastated. Julie's Corrie contract had ended. Prospects of getting back on the show were unlikely unless she got more experience. So she joined Oldham Rep and a year later returned to Granada, desperate for another chance. I was back, knocking on the door 12 months to the day. And what did they say to you? Who are you? I said, what? What do you mean, who am I? They'd forgotten me. Well, of course they had, you know, that's showbiz. I brought the lad's mother around. For the next three years, Julie brought up her son, Gary, but only managed to pick up minor roles in other Granada productions, while Corrie continued to go from strength to strength. Its army of loyal viewers rose from hundreds of thousands to 20 million. Finally, in 1970, a role in the Granada production of Family at War got Julie noticed by Corrie producers. You think I'm common, don't you? No. It's a manager's house, isn't it? It must be lovely for you living in a house like this. Then, ten years after she first watched Corrie, Julie got her big break. She joined as a full-time cast member on the 18th of May, 1970, introduced as the tarty mate of Irma Barlow. I'd know that daft laugh anyway. Hiya, Betty Lynch, what are you doing here? Swanking a bit, aren't you? Mark, who's talking? It's not so long since you were drinking vinegar out of a chip bag. When you went back into the show, very quickly, Bet Lynch became a real fixture of Coronation Street. How soon was it after you started again? Did you believe that you were onto something that might be really long-lasting with Bet? I was determined it was going to be long-lasting. There was no way they were going to throw me out again. No way. Whatever I had to do... If they said jump, I said how high. I, I, this was where I wanted to be and where I was staying. Coronation Street characters, I think, they start off as maybe five lines on a piece of paper, and then it's up to the actor to take that and, and mould it and to make it into something else, which, again, attracts the writer, and then the writer starts to see a f the form of an idea, and then it works like that. And Bet, I think, and Julie took that to the extreme. The character of Bet was midway between that of an angel and a whore. Hello, Mr. Fairclough. Talk about being a stranger. Within weeks, Bet became the Rover's barmaid, and in just a couple of months, her character was a huge success. Women loved her no-nonsense attitude, and men, well, they just loved her. Wow, doesn't she look sharp, eh? Beautiful face. Great. Big. You had a different shape, darling. Oh. <laughs> when she was in her prime, there's no doubt about it that, um, Bat Lynch was seen as a bit of all right. She was the working class girl made good and blossomed when she came into the bar because her sassy lines, her feistiness. Mm, I'll split these things, honest. You get paid extra if you do. Keep your hands to yourself. There is now a term, you know, she looks a bit Bat Lynch, isn't there, for some of her brassy sort of, kind of bit like, looks a bit like a prostitute, I suppose. She's a slut. She's hard as nails. Some would say she's a tart with a heart. Some would say she's all fur coat, no knickers. Have one yourself, this Ebet, for bringing a bit of glamour into our lives. But she's very soft underneath and very vulnerable. She was always there if, if there was a problem. In that's got a two-week-old bastard gurgling away across the street. Oh, oh, I'm not having any slangy matches in my pub. She's hostile. She's defensive. She's offensive. Would you like me better if I had a big car? No. Oh, well. She was fabulous, front of house, the best barmaid in any soap ever. I remember the impact you had through a TV screen in the days when there were only three channels. Mm. You, you were the biggest stars in the country. Oh, right? yeah, you know, and we expected. It was normal. 19, 20 million viewers was quite normal. Which is huge audience. It's colossal. Half the mature population of, of the United Kingdom will sit down to watch this show. If you ask anyone about Coronation Street, who do you remember, they'll always say Bet Lynch. You forget at the time, there weren't that many soap queens. It was in the early days of soap that she sort of became famous. People like Julie um, couldn't go anywhere without being recognised. You admitted earlier that when you were very young, 
you, you know, you wanted to be famous, wanted yeah. to be a celebrity. Yeah. Here you are in your dream show. Mm -hmm. You're the mm -hmm. star of the show, one of the top stars. Of the I show. never thought of myself as the star. But you were you treated know? as such by the papers, weren't you? Well, well, but we all were. Yeah. You know, it was like, it was a bit like living in a bubble, really. Because, you know, you are looked after. You know, you go to makeup, you go to, your clothes are there. You know, so uh, well, as soon as I got in work, I could turn into bed in an hour. I mean, a lot of people think soap stars play themselves, the best ones, mm. because that's how they're so convincing. Mm. How much like bet were you in real life, do you think? I put as much as I possibly could uh, of my experiences, of the knockbacks and everything else. I was lucky I had a lot, really, to be able to draw on. Never meant to hurt me. Following all that had happened to Julie in her early life, starring in Coronation Street should have marked a change in her fortune. I'm going to London with them for a while. When I get back, I wish you out of here. I live here. But as her importance grew on screen, her personal life made no such improvement off it and went from bad to worse. Julie's first marriage had ended in divorce after just three years, but she managed to juggle bringing up her son and starring in a top soap. In 1973, aged 31, older but not necessarily any wiser, she got hitched for the second time, this time to a local Manchester businessman, Tony Rudman. You remarried, you had a big celebrity wedding as it was at mm. the time, a lot of the cast mm. were there, it was a huge event, and your second husband mm. literally runs away at the reception. Mm. With the best man. So when did you realise what had happened on the day? During, sort of, where, when I was looking for him, during the reception. He just gone. Yeah, and I think I gave probably one of the best performances of my life during that uh, day, and I went back to work, which was a blessing, with all the usual jokes. Whoa, give a good honeymoon, blah blah blah, and that carried on. And I just went to work, and I came home. I went to work, and I came home. Um, and everybody knew what had happened, did they? No. So no. you kept this secret. Yes. Yeah. I did. I mean, how could you have worked? No. It was easier. It was much easier to work. Did you regularly, do you think, over the years, hide behind Bet, the character, when you needed Often. to? Often. She was your escape route. She was my best mate. Mm. Yeah, I think Julie really did use the character of Bet to get her through bad times because um, Bet was a very sort of strong, brassy character where nothing affected her. It was a way of presenting herself to the world, uh, and I think a way of showing that you know I'm still standing. The, the real life might have fallen apart dramatically at times, but Bet was always there. Your second husband disappeared from the reception. Your life's in turmoil, but being Julie, you go back to work, you keep it quiet, you don't tell anybody. But slowly inside you, you're falling to pieces and you suffer a complete breakdown. The next thing I knew, I was a barefoot, but I didn't know it was me. And I was walking to a hospital to get help. And fortunately, you know, they did take me in at the hospital. When you look back on that day, how do you feel about that? Very grateful to still be here and making coherent sentences to you or to anybody. And did you ever hear from Tony again? No, and the marriage was annulled and he got half of everything, half of my bank account, half of the, uh, the property. So it was really it was like beginning again financially as far as I was concerned. How did concerned. you feel about that aspect of this? Very disillusioned by men. I mean, your father disappeared, your real father. Mm. Your first husband left the country. Second husband disappears at reception. I mean, by now, you must be almost in a position where you couldn't trust another man again, aren't you, in your mind? Yeah, yeah, it was getting that way. It was getting that way. And it was soon after you, you recovered and came out that you had your first relationship with a woman. It's hardly surprising, Pierce, is it? I was going to say that... You know what I mean? I thought, well, the it's... The build-up is coming, isn't it? Worth a try. <laughs> Can't be any worse. I'm getting in Under your skin For us,
Plus Fleet Street hacked, this was absolute gold dust. In the 80s, tabloid sales were struggling until editors realised there was a real appetite for stories about soap stars. And scandals about Julie's tangled love life sold buckets of papers. In those days, there was this explosion of popularity and interest in the soaps because the viewing figures were phenomenal. These were the things that were uniting the consciousness of the nation. So, newspapers, they got straight into them. As soon as tabloid editors started looking into the actors' real lives, it became apparent that obviously they're all up to no good. It's a great British disease, isn't it? We build them up, we build them up, we build them up and then knock them down. It seems to be a national pastime. The boozing, the parties, the women, the drugs, you know, it all comes. So obviously there were tons of stories out there that we could write about them. It's a different sort of fame, soap fame, from Hollywood fame. A Hollywood star had come to Britain and they'd be in awe of a Hollywood star, but a soap star is in your living room so you feel you know them so there's no hiding place whether she had a relationship with a woman or a man it was eagerly sought after by the press you know that's what people like to read about really who is screwing who so she was always paying the penalty that stardom brings that wherever you go some guy will be behind you with a huge lens this confusing period was a nightmare for Julie but a dream for the tabloid papers Famously, after a four-year lesbian relationship with her housekeeper, Julie got engaged to Cory boss Bill Gilmore, but he called the wedding off just three days before the ceremony. Then, in 1985, she very quickly married for a third time to Californian airline executive Richard Scrobb. But there'll be no fairy tale ending this time either. What do you think is happening to you through this period in terms of yourself, relationships, your sexuality? Are you just basically... Looking Well, for are love. you confused about what you really Looking are? Looking for love. Right. It's as simple or as complicated as that. Had you ever been properly in love, do you think, through that period? No. No. When you married the third time, having been through two mm. pretty well disasters, did you think you were in love then? No. So why do it? I don't know if you're ready for this. I'm ready for anything after this. <laughs> there is nothing you could say now that Are would you surprise sure? me. <sighs> he was dying with leukemia. It's crazy. Did you know that? Yeah. And is that why you married? He needed me. He really did. There you go. But the marriage only lasted two years, and eventually in 1987, Richard died of his illness. Judy's life continued to go from crazy to plain surreal. But it wasn't just stories about her personal life that sold papers. In the late 80s, with Corrie ratings as high as ever, it appeared that success may have gone to her head. I was beginning to hear gossip about her antics on set. It was around this time, there's a whole slew of stories in the papers and gossip columns about you being a diva and treating people badly and all that kind of thing. Some of which, I have to say, I published yeah. as editor of The Mirror. Because Absolutely, most of those were from you, you little boy. <laughs> Weren't they? Let's be honest. But the, the reality, as I remember it, is that we had equal measures of people from the set of Coronation Street and the surroundings coming on, half of them or more, loving you and, thank god and saying you were the most professional person on set and they thought you were brilliant at what you did and you were the star of the show and then others would come on saying you were difficult and haughty and you know didn't want to know the lesser ones all that kind of thing could you be difficult to work with i am in my work a perfectionist i'm harder on myself than anybody else could be do you tolerate mediocrity? No. So is that where friction might arise? It could. There was always this big issue about, you know, uh, the fact that we all wrote about her diva-like tendencies. Was it because, you know, we were just all out to get her, we were on a downer with her? I mean, I, I would say that's rubbish. I mean, the reason we wrote about it, they were good stories, and she was obviously annoying people, so they were, they were leaking them to the press. There have always been people from, you know, runners to crew members to certain actors who have sold stories. Whether or not those stories are true, I do not know, but it all 
adds to a mythology. I knew for a fact that if you cross the line with Julie, um, then, you know, she'd tell you, she'd tell you straight. She could be a cow. She did not suffer fools lightly. Now, she would help me as long as she could see me helping myself. If by diva you mean a perfectionist who liked to get the makeup on and the wardrobe, which she'd sort of suggested some of the leopard print and work with people to create the best thing that you could do on screen, yeah, I suppose that means diva. Moving to the mid-90s and you make a fairly momentous decision to leave Coronation Street. Yeah. Why did you decide to leave? How were you really feeling about that? Because this has been your life for 25 yeah. years. Very excited, very excited, uh, thinking, you know, uh, God, I won't need to be up at six every morning, you know, time for me. Bet quit became a huge story, of course it did. Massive news event. But how can you call it quitting when somebody's done 25 years? You're still leaving. Good service. Because you were leaving when people yeah, still Yeah, but, but leaving, isn't that a nicer word than quit? Quit's a shorter word, it fits. Well, yeah, I suppose. <laughs> and you, in the world you come from, yeah. Leaving and it's more dramatic. Leaving, yeah. quit. Okay. Simple as that. All right. Bet quits with a picture of you by Awful. Ben. And it all fits. Yeah. That's simple. That's how it works. When you walked out that last day, ratings were still huge. Oh, fantastic. And my beloved Coronation Street was on a high. Get out! This pub shut! For her to leave was a big, monumental thing. It couldn't have been bigger, really. I mean, she was, you know, at the top. When she went, I mean, I remember working that night and writing the front page and inside, and we did the first three pages on it. You know, the Daily Mirror for a soap opera left, and other newspapers did the same, so that gives you an idea of what a big story it was. I mean, there really was that feeling, you know, she was Coronation Street, could it survive? Of course it did, but, you know, people were quite hyped about it. It was lump in the throat time, I think, for the viewers, and Julie too, and uh, even hard bit of technicians may have thought, we got to miss her. It's over and done with. And that's that. People fell in love with that character and loved her for 25 years, which is more than a lot of relationships, really. Julie Goodyear was awarded the medal for services to television drama. Just as Julie left Corrie, her 25-year service was honoured with a Lifetime Achievement Award and an MBE sealed her position as Queen of the Street. Like many soap stars who've walked out on the shows that have made them famous, Judy lined up a lot of projects in hope that she would find fame and fortune away from Corrie. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Judy Goodyear. Some people might think that she was a bit naive to think she could leave Bet behind, but when she left, she'd been promised a chat show, which of course she filmed a pilot for. She'd also been promised a film, which fell through. Why are the shutters down at the Rovers and Bet in bed? Because the real Julie Goodyear is here, that's why. She really had her head full of, you know, ideas of grandeur. Um, and, you know, so she thought, I'll quit while I'm on top and go and do something else. Of course, it didn't quite work out like that. It's the assumption that you're going to take this character, these skills, and they will stand up everywhere else. Like, she had plans to do a chat show. It didn't get past the pilot stage. With luck, there'll be laughter, there may be tantrums and tears. But you won't switch off. Soap stars get to the top of their game, think they're invincible, leave, think they're going to get loads of work. The streets are littered with soap stars who've thought that and who are basically on the dole. Did you believe that you would be able to play other roles, given how massive Bette Lynch was in the public I psyche? Yeah, I thought... I didn't see any reason, until I found out otherwise, that that, that would virtually put a, 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 an end uh, to sort of working life. Why should it? Coronation Street had also taken a nosedive, Julie's final episode, pulling in 19 million viewers. But only nine months later, the show had hemorrhaged nearly 10 million viewers, a good chunk of them seduced by the goings-on at Albert Square. EastEnders were riding high, winning all the awards, getting all the ratings, and Coronation Street was sort of the poor cousin, which you know, they hadn't really ever been before. So they were quite desperate and they thought, we need something really major. What, who's the best character that the show ever had? Well, Bette Lynch, let's get her back. 
seven years after Julie had resigned from Corrie, her old bosses at Granada made the monumental decision to resurrect Bet. Julie was invited back, as the tabloid said, to save the show. It was an out-and-out -out declaration of war against EastEnders. She's bold, she's brassy, and she's back. With trademark cigarette holder Bet Lynch, as embodied by actress Julie Goodyear, had plenty to smile about today. All soaps go through doldrums and ups and downs. So when she was invited back, it was a bit of a gimmick, let's be honest. They made a decision that they needed to get back to the roots. They needed to get back to what it was, what it was all about in the 60s. And the only real character that was left that, that kind of epitomised that was Bette Lynch. There was a great trumpeting went on from Granada TV about the mistresses coming back. It doesn't take much for the press to pick up on those vibes and turn it into she is the saviour of the street. And of course, Julie would have loved the idea that she was the saviour of the street. The crew, as always, were fantastic. Would you believe they played God Save the Queen? <laughs> and we all laughed. It broke the tension, and the first scene went in one, like a rocket, no problem. And that should have been it, you know? You're back, fine. But it wasn't. Correct. Give that girl a coconut. Quite a lot of them, especially the older cast, um, felt like I did. Oh dear. This is going to be a very, very testing time. This was literally hired big noise, big trailers, big interviews, big drum roll, and then she was chucked into this system that she didn't even recognise. What kind of Coronation Street did you find when you walked back through the door compared to how you had left it? Only the sets were the same. Everything else had changed. The sets really were the only things that were the same. A whole bunch of sexy young things had joined the cast, and they were very much the new soap superstars. The way the series was made was also completely different. When Judy left in 1995, they were making two programmes a week. But by the time she came back in 2000, they were churning out five. Obviously, the older members of the cast had been there while this huge transition period of going to five episodes had taken place, so they were used to it. The kids coming in had only ever worked like that anyway, so everybody was fine, Apart from except you. me. How were I you didn't feeling? even know what day it was, what page I was on, what scene I was doing. I was absolutely panic stricken. Whereas before there was a set amount of time for rehearsal, that had gone. Everything that was taken for granted, all the facilities in the studios, from the wardrobe, the makeup, the, the limousines, everything, all that had gone. And there's all these young kids there who are kind of used to that because they know no different. But, you know, she's sort of an old school soap star. I'm pretty lucky. I, I, I didn't need makeup. What the hell could you do with a face like this? Only smack it with a bat. But Julie, people like Julie, with, with the wig and the makeup and the frock and. They had to be in an hour and a half, two hours before me. So you want to try that for like a ten week stretch. And that is hard. As always, with you being this huge soap star character, there were a load of stories in the papers almost immediately about what was going on behind the scenes. People who wanted to stick the knife into you, whatever. It was clear things weren't going well. I'm going to read you a charge sheet of tabloid tittle-tattle at the time. These are basically right. things that <clears throat> appeared that suggested that you were making a series of unreasonable demands. So I'll put them to you. Just let me know your reaction to each of one. Of course. Miss Goodyear had expected a level of deference from the young cast that was not forthcoming. No. You didn't expect to be treated like... Not at all. ...the big star that you clearly were. No. Do you think that perhaps some of the younger ones resented the fact that the headlines have been, back comes bet to save failing Corey? But why should any of the kids been jealous? Uh, well, because it implied that they had failed and that they had to go back to you to save the show. Do you think that inspired a bit of resentment from the younger ones? Did you feel that at all? Never. Uh, it says you were told to put out your cigarette in the now non-smoking rest area. Do, no. you remember, do you remember anything going on like that? No. It says that you asked for a lot of money and extra money when you realised how hard it was going to be. Money? No. Did you ask for your own makeup trailer with Extractor Fan? Well, that's a good one, isn't it? 
Well, I should have done. And your own driver? To, to drive me where? To and from the studio. No. So none of these things... What, sort of, what sort of bloody insiders do you mix with? These were all stories that appeared in the papers at the time. Claims from people on, you know, trying to... Yeah. ...have a go at you. There you go. None of them true? No. No. I can tell you that there were several cast members who were deliberately... Really? ...spreading malicious gossip about you. Really? Yeah. Would that shock you? Yes. Would you feel betrayed by that? Yes. Have you never suspected that? Never. Ever. Kids with guns. Kids with guns. She got in her own head that the programme had gone into decline because she wasn't in it. So therefore she was being brought back. So therefore these people should be grateful. And these people should be, you know, <laughs> throwing palms down like Jesus coming in. You know, it's a Jerusalem. Kids with guns. All the people who remember that Kids were all pleased. Whereas um, younger members of the cast who'd come in were totally indifferent, you know, and uh, inclined to be disparaging and disrespectful, I think. They didn't realise that there was supposed to be this big hierarchy and that you had to be so deferential to her, um, which I imagine would have totally annoyed her. These were sharp kids who, who'd got their own, they'd got their own blood, they'd got their own kind of career. Who is this woman? She's a has-been. Why does she think we have to look up to her? They uh, criticised the way she looked. They uh, made out that she was being devery on set. This woman come in, and this hefty pay, this hefty reputation. They were dragging her back down to earth the best way they knew how. When you got to the second week, and um, you're already finding this a bit of a nightmare, clearly, mm. how did the second week unfurl for you? Worse. It was just going from bad to worse. I, I really could not... I couldn't work the way that they were, that they work now. So as that week came to an end, mm -hmm. you were beginning to feel that you just couldn't do this. That's right. I really was. Was it affecting your health? Yes. In, in what way? I was having panic attacks. I, I was, I felt sick, diarrhea. I, I, I couldn't function. All the personal stuff and the headlines that go with it, it, whilst being hurtful, you've been able to put your bet lynch head on and say, dust yourself down, mm. get on with it. Mm. And the reason this all really hurts you is it attacked the very core of what you're about, your professionalism. I couldn't do it. And I could not understand why I couldn't do it. It was like being in a car crash. It was like being on a conveyor belt at 90 odd miles an hour and being thrown off and nobody there to catch you. If you said, oh, she did this and she did that, I don't think she really cares. But attack of professionalism and then, and then, you know, that's where it hurts. This is a woman whose personal life and career had been dissected and they were now vivisecting Julie Goodyear because she could not cope with the schedule. We had to do it to the best of our ability uh, and, and Julie, had, you know, she, she couldn't do that because she wanted it to be the best it could be. She felt it was disloyal to the character to then cut corners, to just be on time and stand there. She didn't even know where she was looking half the time because it was such a fast turnover. Julie's comeback crisis came to a head on the 25th of May. Unbeknownst to Granada and even Julie herself, she spent what was to be her last day on set. So you woke up finally and just thought, I can't do this. Well, I didn't wake up because I've been awake all night yet again. And I made two phone calls. Typical me, first to Granada, and the second to my doctor. Did you feel like you were having another breakdown then? Mm. Mm. Do you recognise the signs? Yeah, I could, yeah. And there was no way I was going back up that path. Not at all. So probably for the first time in your life, you put mm. yourself before the show? Absolutely. Because you had to? Yeah. No choice. Julie's triumphant return had been a total disaster. She'd only survived 17 days of the new Corrie regime and it had almost driven her mad. Under tremendous pressure, she'd finally jumped ship. How did Granada take the... Not well. Not well. Because it, it looked bad for them. They'd made this big commitment bringing you back. My own doctor came, examined me, and, and it was, you know. It was no bullshit. It was impossible. I, could, I couldn't have done anything. There were some stories at the time suggesting that you were fired. <laughs> yeah, right. 
No, I wasn't. Of course I wasn't. If I could have gone back in, how could I? No. No. It was just you couldn't actually... I couldn't yeah. work the way. I couldn't hack it. From a viewer's point of view, it was like, what? You felt completely robbed. From the press's point of view, it was, ha ha, you know, cackling witches. It was almost like rubbing your hands with glee that she'd failed. Any hack who had some sort of, uh, had a grudge, and there was plenty of them, um, decided to stick the knife in. Let's not forget the great, you know, um, British mentality of building them up and knocking them down. I think people just thought, well, it's a bit wimpy, isn't it? I mean, 17 days and you found it a bit tough. What's your problem? Um, and so she did get some really terrible press. Look, you're on 200 grand a year for a reason in the public eye. You are up there, you know, to be shot at. I just think her self-esteem, her confidence, everything that she'd used to get her through a bloody awful life had been attacked at that time, so I think it was the dark night of the soul for her. Do you remember the headlines at the time? Oh, it was day after day. It was relentless. If that had happened in a ring to a fighter, the ref would have stopped the game. You thought you'd become a punch bag? I was. There's no two ways about it. I was. But the one wonderful thing it gave to me, Piers, I went through the pain barrier. And that still stands today. Whatever was printed about me now, could never, ever, ever hurt me anymore. And that's a pretty good feeling. But it took all of that to get there. Did any members of the cast contact you afterwards? You've got to remember, Piers, they were still in the thick of it, you know? And it was relentless. And I just wanted to be quiet anyway. But your main feeling was one of relief. Oh, tremendous relief, yeah. Do you still watch Coronation Street? My loyalty to Coronation Street is beyond question. Truly, Pierce. And if I could go back apart from that one hiccup, I can honestly say I would go back and do it all again. The one shining light in your life has been that you have found true love. Isn't that amazing? Scott and I have been together now for 11 years. I mean, that's just incredible. In classic Julie Goodyear fashion, <laughs> he was a, brought you some cement to your house. I know. He knows the way to a girl's heart. He, he was a toy boy with cement, I and know. your heart melted. Uh, completely. Scott is 27 years younger than you. I know. Do you commend a toy boy to ladies of your age? You've obviously never met him. I think he was about 90 at birth. <laughs> but I love him. Of all the people I've ever interviewed, I don't think anyone has had a life quite like yours, Julie. When you look back on your life, do you have any regrets? No. You'd do it all again? Mm-hmm. Good, bad, ugly? Yeah. And no bitterness. And do you feel now, personally, happier than you've ever been in your life? Yes, I do. I'm at a really, really good place. A nice place. And to all your critics, of which there have been a few over the years, what would you say to them? Piss off! Next week, Piers talks to Donny Osmond. Next tonight on BBC One, it's Film 2007.